Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Why don't you write when you don't need money, honey? That would certainly make a hit. Welcome back to Word Docs. I am your host of the day, Alex Vickery Howe, um, unleashed with Amy T. Matthews. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm Alex Vickery Howe. That's the bit you do the um on. That's the bit, the bit I do the um on. So go back and. <laughs> Good Lord. If- Every time, um, is it that I, is it is, is it that I struggle with my name? Is that what's uh, actually yeah, happening maybe. here? Maybe, maybe you don't know who you are anymore. Oh, well, um, that's that's the theme of the day. So I'm also here with <laughs> Sean L. Williams. Hello, I'm pretty sure I know who I am. <laughs> It's just one of the basics of life. Our theme here today is juggling multiple projects and, in fact, juggling multiple identities. And uh, I'm going to throw to Amy first and make her my my first victim of the day because Amy doesn't know who the hell she is. (laughs) Not today. (laughs) Particularly not today. (laughs) Yes, so we were talking about this, this episode and talking about juggling multiple projects and how I have to juggle being multiple people as well. So I have have multiple contracts and I as Amy Matthews and multiple people even as Amy Matthews so I get to be Amy Matthews the scholar Amy Matthews the literary fiction writer Amy Matthews the short story writer and they're all slightly different people and now I'm working on a book which is due at the end of August to my agent which is taking Amy Matthews slightly into the more commercial realm so kind of crossover literary mainstream fiction which is finding a whole new voice and has been quite stressful this year is, is- Johnny confused? Like, does Johnny know who he's living with from day to day? <sighs> he probably enjoys it, let's face it. He's very hyperactive. <laughs> he can probably keep up with different people. <laughs> it's almost polygamous, this relationship. It is. Yeah, it's getting there. I, I feel a bit lost. I'm really struggling this year, actually, because Amy Barry's new, so I don't really know who she is that well yet. Like, it's a slightly new voice, and this Amy Matthews is a slightly new voice for me. So I have to get a... Is that conscious? Like, is that, sorry to interrupt, but is that a conscious yeah. thing that you do? Uh, you go, I'm putting a new yes. voice on today. Yes, and I think right. it's it's a new thing for me because you know when you start out, uh, you're not really across any of that yet. Like when you're mm. first writing, you're just finding your voice. So you're, and I think acting must be similar. Like you mm-hmm. just you are you, and you're trying these things on, and then over time you've got enough skills to kind of bend yourself. Like I can, it's all me now. Like it's all I don't feel mm. like it's inauthentic ever. Like it's mm-hmm. never a, like a forced performance, but I can change my voice. And, but I think that was always one of my skill sets. You know how like Alex is really, really good at, um, you're good at voice, at really humorous voice and high energy voice. And Sean, you're very, very good at being across the genres you're in. Like you go across multiple genres and you're good at adapting to those without losing your voice, I think. That's one of your oh, great cool. skills. I hope so. Uh, Thanks. One thing I always had that was a downside as well as a benefit was breadth, was that I could be mm-hmm. a total chameleon. Mm. And that was a real downside when I started out because no two books would be the same. So how the hell do you brand yourself? <laughs> uh, see, that's yeah. interesting because when you yeah. mention actors, um, I, I thought – to myself, despite the fact that in drama school people are taught to be versatile and stretch themselves, out there in the industry they're looking for commodification and yes, um, yeah. branding. And I have an actor friend who just went to a branding expert in Los Angeles who oh, gave wow. him three three words. I can't quite remember what they were, but one of them was neurotic. <laughs> and he summed up my friend's personality. This is a friend I've known since kindergarten in three words. And I went, yeah, that that was yeah. pretty good. It was like neurotic, but trying to hide it. There was some, but it was in three words. And they said, go to every audition with those three words in mind because that is what you're bringing to the table. And a lawyer can be like that, a doctor can be like that, a judge, it doesn't matter what you're doing. And it's interesting because I kind of hear what you're saying then as a writer that um, if it's hard to um, box you, that is on on one level a strength, but on another level a a complication. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when you say three words, I can think of the things that are consistent in mind, like pace is something I do well. Like everyone talks about page turning, like being able to read it very quickly quickly so even when I write literary fiction it's pacey and I think I've got quite a strong um, voice 
as well, but it changes from book to book, <laughs> like radically. And even that was one of the problems with End of the Night Girl when I sent that. It got re- so many rejections at the beginning because the two voices in there are so distinct. They're mm. so different. That's true of End of the Night Girl, yeah, but that's one of the strengths of End of the Night Girl, I think. Yes. But I think people never never knew what to do with it. Like if you took – and I remember my agent going, you know, if you just took one voice out, it would be one kind of book, and if you took the other one out, it would be another kind of book. And people don't quite know how to read it, I think. But I thought that was the point point of it I mean I it thought was. that was the yeah. Yeah. yeah but then people were quite disturbed that the the first person chick lit voice uh, stood up so strongly against the weight of this kind of very literary <laughs> historical mm. voice like they didn't know what to do with that and then I think the rest of my career has been working out how to use the strengths like how to how to capitalize on that yeah partly that's being different people like having different names so what mm. has been interesting this year because every other time I've done it I've sat in one of those personas for quite a while so Tess Lasso, you know, the last three, four years has been with her. Um, yes. And Amy Matthews has just done short stories in that time. And that worked. But now trying to be Amy Matthews and Amy Barry at the same time is interesting. Like, it, it's just been fascinating because I'm working on, like, I did both pitches at the same time and then did sample chapters and stuff. And now I'm being Amy Matthews for the American summer. So I've had three months to put the book together, maybe a bit longer because I think I started when we first did lockdown, but it, lockdown was a little bit disconcerting. And then I had mm. to go do pitches for Amy Barry. So I got distracted a bit but I'm now back in that Amy Matthews thing until the end of August and then I yeah. have to write Amy Barry's book from then until the end of February I can't wait until your personas collaborate <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like Two Face. I'll be down the middle. Yeah, I imagine Herman's Herman's head, the show from yeah. the nineties and the early, or I guess Inside Out for the young for the younger listeners out there. But I a was shocked to hear that your deadline was end of August because you've been saying it soon, and I didn't realise yeah. you meant that soon. Yeah, yeah. August twenty twenty one, I presume. <laughs> yeah. No. Five we weeks away. A time of recording, five weeks mm. away. Yes, I yes, know. Oh, by the time you hear this, I'll be much closer and much more caffeinated. <laughs> yeah. The other question I had, though, is around how you divvy up your time because you're describing doing all these things broadly at the same time, but not surely in the same day. You're not waking up and then at lunch becoming another person, are you? Are you? Uh, no, I can't do that very well, but I did have to when I was doing the pitching and the outlines. And it's funny because I, I had a conversation recently. I've had a couple actually recently. With, with myself. With literary, <laughs> with literary authors or people. Uh, one was a literary author in Australia and one was an, a beginning author. Like, so mm-hmm. someone who's really just working on their first couple of books. And they were both very, it's a kind of very romantic, like old school romantic way of doing it, of just talking about how you have to be true to the thing and put it out in the world and... And really this reluctance to tailor yourself to the market and that's yeah. just the polar opposite of where I'm at. So it yeah. feels so alien to me. Like that's how I was when I first started out. Like this is what I'm making, this is what it is and and it's just not it's not the way my career is. I know there are different ways to have a career, but that's not my life. The, the pragmatist in me says that it's lovely as an ideal and I, I, th- I have a little bit of that in me, but there's another part of me that goes pragmatically you can't necessarily follow the muse wherever she mm. leads, I think. Well, I think I know. worked out a while ago that I want to be a working writer and that's what yes. I say to my agent. It's like I just, I'm happy when I'm working, please get me working because there, I've been an unpublished writer and no. it wasn't fun. I didn't no. love it. And, you know, if Paul Oster always said that he was happy, he never got published for a long, 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 long time and the manuscripts just built up and he was okay with the idea of being unpublished in his lifetime and then someone would find all the manuscripts <laughs> after his death and realise he was a genius and publish them. And I just was like, nah, I don't want to do that. No. <laughs> I want to I work. Mm, I want to work. Absolutely. I want to be recognised as a genius right now. <laughs> the difficulty you've got, Amy, is that you're, you're wearing these three hats and you're doing all this work and meeting these incredible deadlines on top of working a full-time job teaching because you're back at yeah. uni now. Mm-hmm. And your yeah. study leave is unfortunately yes. finished. You're back teaching again when we record this it's our first week of semester isn't it yes first week of semester yes yes, <laughs> yes. yes so when is. you're hearing us students we're, we're just in week one middle of week yeah, one yeah and developing new courses yeah. and 
uh, dealing with crises, yeah. both professionally and for students. So it's it's multiple hats, or in fact, multiple hairstyles in Amy's case. <laughs> <laughs> this is when you know I'm getting stressed, the hair changes. <laughs> the, the hair changes. <laughs> so for those of you, you can't see me, but I went from blonde to bright red. <laughs> and that's yeah. my students say, you know, you can never know what I'm going to turn up as. And in fact, all the videos I've recorded, the video lectures are going to be oh, that's updated. True. I don't look like ah, that anymore. It's, it's a different um, person, a different Amy. <laughs> But it is when that thing where you're saying, do you shift halfway through the day? Because of the day mm. job, yes, like you do. So, I mean, you do have to be writing lectures and um, articles and you know, all the admin stuff we do. So yesterday I spent most of the day on the phone sorting out administration stuff. Um, and then, of course, Monday hit week one and you get this deluge of student emails yeah, absolutely. and admin emails. So I've gotten very good at not being romantic, like just going, well, the romantic ideal of art is a complete luxury that mm. is not mine. Mm. So yeah. I don't have that. So if I have an hour, I'm writing. I'm just going to sit down and do what I can. I agree completely that the pragmatist in me says you've got to work and that requires certain certain parameters, certain ways of thinking. I'm going to pivot to Llewellyn now. I know I'm not pronouncing it correctly. He thought he was going to get away with, with not being, you know, probed. That sounds quite disconcerting. I, I am deeply disconcerted. <laughs> with consent. Probed with consent. <laughs> so how does it work for you, Sean? So you, you don't wear multiple identities necessarily, but I feel like you're juggling 101 well, I've things. I've been a bit of a, a juggler of different styles and different genres. I mean, I write for middle grade YA and adults across fantasy, science fiction, uh, horror, mainstream fiction, uh, short stories, micro fiction, poetry, novels, series, all these different things really interest me. And in an ideal world, I'd have many, many clones all churning out the all the different things that I want to do. At the moment, um, I'm really keen to write a crime novel because uh, I thought of a great idea the other day, but that's mm. yet Ooh. another genre that I haven't been published in. And yeah. I don't know, at some point, my agent's going to just throw her hands up in the air and, and go, what are you, what are you doing to me? But I keep saying, I keep asking <laughs> if you? I can use, yeah, that's right. Well, I keep asking if I can use a pseudonym and, and everybody, agents, editors, fellow writers all say no. Well, you're famous enough. There's no way you should because you'll bring all those readers with I you. I don't know. Do I? Anyway, so at the moment I'm juggling the full-time job uh, like we all are here and trying to learn how to fit writing novels around it. Can I ask mm. you some questions? about that because you're the new, newest to that like the full-time yes I'm the baby academic teaching <laughs> teaching role well you've done lots of other jobs uh, uh, while writing mm. and lots of multitasking but the first time that you've really been inundated with like a full-time academic teaching and research and admin load while trying to produce work how are you finding that like what are the challenges or the mental challenges or because I find energy is the hardest thing like you mm. guys say have you watched this tv I can't even watch tv like I yeah, sit there I, I on get the couch. to that point I get to that point where I hit a wall and can't even watch a show I wish I could generate more energy it's not even time it's just energy yeah I have definitely struggled with that this year and the last half of last year where I was 0.7 but really about 1.2 <laughs> it is hard and I do watch a bit of television to you know like an hour or two at night just to refresh my love of narrative and see what other people are doing. Mm. And to see your wife <laughs> so that you can, you can actually hang out. Yeah. Go, go, go back to the well, right? You, know, you often talk about going back to the well or, mm. or, you know, like going back to rediscover why you do this stuff in the first place, I think is important. Well, back when I was a full-time writer, I, I became a full-time writer because I signed those three trilogy contracts at once, which meant I had to write four books a year. And I <laughs> learned very well. quickly <laughs> oh that uh, I, A, I could do it, and B, that it required absolutely no romanticism at all and a very yeah. keen sort of work ethic to the process of writing. Mm. So, How did you look after yourself? Did you find you had to exercise or no, you oh, didn't? Oh, no. Okay. This is why I have RSI and uh, all sorts of physical problems now. I'm not a very exercisey kind of person anyway, but I just I would write new material in the morning, edit new material in the afternoon and promote newly published material uh, in the evening. So I found that very easy because I didn't have anything else getting in the way. It was just all writing material. I mean, they were different kinds of books and that did my head in a little bit. And after three years, I was probably a little bit crazy. But <laughs> but I learned that I could write that quickly and I find juggling different novels quite easy. There are, There's always a way for me to, because I can write fairly quickly, to it was always easy for me to create two or three months for me to write a first draft, but I'm struggling mm. to find a way to do that 
now. So I'm doing shorter things. I'm doing shorter works. And I find music is something that I can work on very quickly in the evening. So that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm doing, nice. doing more music these days. So Because it's cognitive depletion is the problem, yeah. right? Is that oh, I've the, never heard that phrase before. <laughs> but, you know, the immense focus that you have to bring to tasks in academia, even admin tasks, are like, yes. are really, it's like doing a cryptic crossword or something. It takes this incredible focus. Mm. Well, it's strategic. Um, it's it's you're yeah. employing strategy. Yeah, and then dealing with students is is if you do it right and you mm. do it well, you're you're giving them an enormous amount of focus and attention and energy. And then you know lecturing is just so much work if you do it well. Yes, like the amount of research and time you put into it, and then the performative aspect of teaching that it's very depleting. Mm. Mm. It's emotionally, physically, and cognitively really depleting. So to have to then keep using your brain <laughs> is hard. It's yeah. really yeah. so. I've been wondering about that because I think a couple of years ago I had a very heavy teaching load mm. and also had three books out in a single year. And what I found was I didn't exercise and I didn't look mm. after myself and I gained weight and I was I just came last. Like I never had time off. Wasn't having fun. Yes. And so thinking about going forward, how to set up my life so that that I do have a balanced life. I forced myself by um, enrolling in it with a personal trainer, and it was the only way. I thought the only way I can do it. I'm not going to go to a gym on my own steam. I'm, I'm going to probably injure myself with gym equipment. That's how that story ends. <laughs> but I thought if I book sessions with someone, it'll force something close to a, a balance. It's not quite yeah. right. Mm. And in fact, he talks to me often and says, I still think you're um, overworked and, you know, yeah. we can see now where my stress headaches are coming from and everything. I oh, see. I get stress headaches too. Do you, Sean? I do. It comes from my neck. Comes yeah, from me here. too, Nick. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Although I realise now that I didn't actually answer your question, I, be, oh, I, I didn't refer to the point that I was aiming to, which is that I, I make myself relax at night because otherwise you yeah. don't have that balance. Mm. And um, having got married or met my wife 15 years ago, you know, I realised there are there are much nicer things to do than yeah. than sitting in front of the computer doing work. So we hang out in the evenings, you know. Mm. I think I've also got further complications of being a single parent yes. and mm. big chunks of the day get eaten up. So of like course. school drop off. It's another hat yeah i try and be around for it i try and i can't do it today because we have a meeting so they'll walk in and i'll i'll have to mute the meeting and wave at them and <laughs> you know normally for half an hour or so after school or an hour i try and give them some attention which means then i'm working at night but then i try and take dinner time off as well so yeah. that we, we always sit down to dinner at the table yes. for an hour and talk to each other we do that too yeah and then i've been trying to you know fit in two nights a week having a date night with my partner so wednesday mm. nights and friday nights we hang out yeah. and not because uh, the kids go to their dads those nights. So it's like, okay, that's our time. But mm. then your life gets very regimented. It's like, okay, now how do I fit in exercise? And then I've got to catch up with all the teaching. And so my, my life does not happen in nine to five <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. And, um, um, when I, I think I may have spoken about this before. When I did my PhD, I cut off the internet at home and forced myself to go to the office oh. from like eight to six. Yeah. I know, I know people who do that at work. Yeah. Mm. And I... I, I wouldn't do that now, but the value of that has sort of stayed with me. So I'm trying, trying to just stop working through nights. And But when you're in a, a creative work that's really exciting for you, yeah. yeah, it's almost unavoidable. You know, you just keep going and going. Oh, I learned not to do that because I, I, I would exhaust myself and then I wouldn't yeah. get anything done the next day. So what I'll do is I'll end while I still want to keep going. And then that wow. excitement and enthusiasm will still be there the next morning. I'll be looking forward See, to I, it. I think I'd struggle to sleep. I'd to be lying yeah. there going, but what about this? What about that? You know, That would happen to me. And Johnny, when we did the interview with him, told the story about how when I'm on really close to the end of deadline, because mm. I speed up as I go. Yeah. I'm quite slow mm. at the beginning. And then by the end, I'm doing like 10, 15,000 words a day. He'll like go to sleep and I'll be typing in bed and mm. then he'll wake up and I'll be typing in bed. But I do sleep. But I got to a point a couple of years ago, one of my good friends, Bronwyn Stewart, who has a book out yes. this week um, called Road to Ruin. Um, hey. She once said to me, I was talking about deadlines. She goes, oh, you know what you do. You do it every time. What you'll do is you won't <laughs> sleep. You'll do nothing but write. It'll all be written in two weeks. And then you'll get really sick for a month. And I <laughs> yeah, was like, right. oh, shh. Like, this is the pattern. Bloody hell. So, like, obviously other people say it. And Johnny used to say it too. And I paid attention after that. It's like I do. I get sick for like four or five weeks, like with a bad flu or 
and I wasn't sleeping enough and I was starting to like not be very well. And so I was like, okay, so sleep has to be, I'm absolutely religious about sleep. Mm. And I said, but the problem with that was saying to John, I can't sit down and watch something with you. Mm. Like, because I have to do some work after dinner, mm. I need to get to bed because I have to get up at six o'clock in the morning to get the kids ready. And I absolutely have to have sleep or I'm just going to get sick all the time. So yeah. at least I'm not getting sick all the time anymore. That's good. It's a, it's a common thing with performers, what you're describing, that people do a, a run of a show and without fail, we'll, we'll get seriously ill the next, not seriously ill, but we'll get run down and sick about a week after yeah. because your body just goes, I must do this. And and then you get through it and then your body says, and now you will pay for what you have done. I used to get it with semesters too. My mum used to say, oh, you'll finish teaching and then you'll get sick after your marking because, yeah. you know, anyone who's done marking knows that it's just you <laughs> on such a tight deadline that you do nothing else. Yeah, I was marking just recently down at Port Elliot. I often go to Port Elliot because it's a nice place to mark and hang out with mum. And do they feed you? Do mum they feed feeds you? me. Yeah, yeah, begrudgingly it happens. And, and also, <laughs> they, but they, they, my, my parents are not heavy drinkers, but I think dad's got into the scotch and coke and mum's got into the wine. So, um, <laughs> COVID, we're all doing it. Yeah, it's like a COVID <laughs> drinking thing going on. But the, the cutest thing is that, uh, their dog, Vida, you know, who I love. I just, Vida's a part, we think part Kelpie, part Staffy, part Dingo part Rhodesian Ridge Rat. <laughs> She's We're not very sure. cute. She's very cute, but, but non-verbal. She doesn't make a lot of noise. And um, I noticed that while I was marking, she would just sit next to me alert. Oh, she's like your marking cat. Yeah, she's like my marking. And like, <laughs> we are marking, we, we are working together. And she wouldn't Aww. even kind of lie down. She'd just be there going, something's happening and I must patrol. That's fab. Um, and it was really cute. So I, I ended up giving myself breaks so I could have Vita time because I thought she's just sitting there like, I don't know, like a, like a mascot. So so um, uh, that's been really kind of cute. How do you juggle things, Alex? You're working on about 25 different secret projects that yeah. you probably can't name. And also <laughs> in different mediums too. Like you, you don't just I juggle books. mediums. I don't juggle people, but I juggle mediums. And and so um, – Aren't mediums people too? None of this anti-medium <laughs> propaganda, thank you. I'll tell you what's interesting though just more recently is that I've always felt um, as a writer going back that I, I always had crazy things I wanted to to unleash and people would stop me or temper me in some way like I want to do this and people would go okay settle down tiger <laughs> and for whatever reason in the last maybe six months um, it's like all the oppositions just stopped and people were going oh yeah we'll do that and I'm like seriously because I'm not even sure if I think we should do that <laughs> and I don't know why that is. Do you is. reckon they trust you more? I think you build up a track uh, Possibly record. there's a trust thing uh, or possibly just lucky because like working on the Decameron with the State Theatre I've never worked with people who have just never, who haven't questioned stuff. So I, I put a monologue in and I, they don't talk to me really. And it just happens. Or I, I might get a call from a director going, Hey, can you qualify that? Um, I mean, just as an example, the other day I put a monologue in and then in retrospect decided I found it a bit dull. So I, um, spoke to Mitchell Butel from State Theatre and said, Oh, what if this character was a priest? But I wrote it in a way going, you're not actually going to do that. Like that's not actually going to happen. But I, I wrote the reasons why I thought it was a good idea in terms of what the monologue was about and blah, blah, blah. And then I just got this wonderful call where it's like, okay, we're going Catholic, we're going Lutheran, what are we doing? I'm, I'm going to get a costume today. And I've just never, never had that. Maybe you've worn them down, Alex, maybe yeah, possibly. after all these years. <laughs> as long as there's not a cat. Like this ridiculous <laughs> idea will arrive on their desk and they'll go, who the hell, what idiot wrote this? Oh, it's Alex. Oh God, we might as well just let him do it. <laughs> Well, I've always been jealous of a playwright called Matthew Widdett, who I don't know. I have a follower of his work, but I don't know him. But he did a version of Robin Hood. You'll love this, Sean. Hmm. Robin Hood, where all the sheriff's men were played by stormtroopers. <laughs> and the sheriff of Nottingham was this, was Carmel Johnson, was a woman who sang show tunes. And it was brilliant. And I sat there and went, That's so good. No one would let me do that. How can Matthew <laughs> Widdett gets to do that? And now I'm starting to, you know, to be able to do things. Hmm. And so I said to a writer friend, the other day, I feel like a dog that's been taken to the beach and let off the leash, but I, I'm not yet confident enough to start running on the beach. And so now um, it's, ben, it's Ben Brooker. Every time I speak to Ben Brooker now, he goes, have you run to the beach yet, Alex? Run to the beach. <laughs> run to the beach. <laughs> so I'm trying to run to the beach more, but juggling multiple mediums is really strange. So I'm working on novels, plays, 
filmed monologues, which are kind of a weird in-between space in the Decameron. I, I don't know if it's theatre or film or what you'd call it. At least it's not porn. It's not yeah. porn, <laughs> although I'm pushing that way. Uh, what? It, it's, um, well, I have a dominatrix with a cactus, oh, course, so that was right. kind of yeah. pushing that way, uh, who was very good. He but- got worried you meant the priest for a second. <laughs> yeah, jeez, where's this going? <laughs> He's just a cool priest. He's just a cool priest who, who says, you know, didn't you pay attention to the Bible? He was trying to tell you to be a nice person and stop judging. And when I read it, back, I went, oh, should be a priest. Obviously should be a priest. Or a man in a stormtrooper outfit because that always livens up a show. <laughs> or a man in a stormtrooper outfit. I dare you to do, because these are people you'll meet in South Australia, I'm commissioning you <laughs> to write a piece of somebody who's in the 501st, a, a, a Star Wars costume. Oh, yeah. Because then you could just have somebody in a costume. In fact, you could do your Trekkie thing because there's the, there's the Mawson as well. So you could totally have your Trekkie with your, your Star Wars fan. You could totally I'd like go to there. Keep it like ambiguous as to whether it's a stormtrooper or a cosplayer. We don't quite know because oh, I wrote one that was, is wait, one that may or may not be a vampire, and no one's talked to me about what they've done. I know the, the actor who performed it, but no one's told me what they've done. Oh. And, and I'm like, is this going to be a vampire or someone who's disturbed or someone who's having fun? We don't. Is it a serial killer? We don't know. But all of the hints are there that this is probably a vampire asking to be invited in. But the other thing I'm doing, which is sort of under embargo or whatever, however you want to describe it is a possible audio project. And that's completely mushed my brain because I'm like, okay, working from theatre to novels is 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 a leap, mm. but working uh, actually turning a play into an audio project is a complete reconception entirely. You guys can't actually see him, but he's massaging his brain as he says that. Yeah, oh, <laughs> oh um, what have I done? I remember working on something. <laughs> One night I was working with a musician on a, on a rock project and it was two o'clock in the morning we were in her studio in the Adelaide Hills, a good friend of mine. And um, at one point she fell to her knees or slowly sunk to her <laughs> knees, nursing her head, kind of leaning on a, a kind of um, soft cube chair that was in her, in her studio. And she just went, and what are we, what are we trying to achieve at the moment? And I went, I, I don't know, Kat. <laughs> no, it's two <laughs> o'clock in the morning. I don't know. So, yeah, so it becomes a kind of, you know, a, a mental traffic jam, but also really exciting because if one art form is getting a bit tiresome, you go, oh, screw it, I'm going to work on the novel now and I'm not going to worry about what the actors are doing, Actually, you know. That is a massive benefit we haven't talked about that we all do is having multiple projects on the go is that you never stop. It makes you saner, more stress but saner. Yeah, mm. but you never stop. Stop. You know, I think we're all so afraid of inertia. We've talked about mm-hmm. that many, many times. Is that when you hit a roadblock on one, you kind of switch to thinking about another one. And it, the act of generating ideas is kind of exponential. The more you do it, the more it happens. It's it's like a muscle that gets exercised. Yes. And I, and I never have really trouble true. coming up with ideas. The problem is too many ideas. Yeah. Whereas when I started out, the problem was how to get an idea. I used to, I've said this before, but I used to focus too much on one thing. And now I'm like, okay, there's a few on the go. Mm. If one falls down, it doesn't really bother me necessarily. Yeah. Yep. But I, what I'm finding is actually they all get stronger because they're all there. And the energy from one project feeds back into to another and so I mean I guess there's a critical mass there is a point where you you must have too many but if I have like three or four things on the go I'm probably happier than if I have one and certainly happier than if I have none oh yes nothing worse than having Mm. none I'm actually slowing down as I get older I'm I find that I'm preferring to have one thing on the go but that could just be because I'm older and my brain is calcifying could also (laughs) be because you're teaching (laughs) full-time You've not done that before. No, that's well. That's taken up an awful <laughs> lot of mental brain space. Doing it for the first time, too. Like new jobs are in the top three of like most stressful life things, too. Yeah. Like, well, so also moving house. Like you've been moving house, Amy, or you yeah. moved. You moved during I, COVID. I'm doing too much. Is what yeah, I'm doing. moving house is I'm massive. I'm actually weirdly saner. I think than I was a couple of years ago, though. Even though I'm feel like I'm doing more, I might have hit a balance point better. You guys are part of that, actually. I've, we've not even mentioned the podcast, which does take up like a day a week at the moment. Mm. This has actually been enormously helpful. So solidarity is always good. Yes. <laughs> yeah, a good laugh. But I think it's been like a really fun way to be reflective as you go. Yeah. And yeah, solidarity too. But we've really reflected on what we're doing as we do it. And you realize there are strategies other people have that you can steal. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. And I think I feel saner when you talk to other people who 
who have similar mindsets and also feel saner, I think, more lately because I'm producing a little bit more. So it doesn't feel like I'm just doing things crazily on the laptop, just t- typing away some mad thing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm typing away mad things that people are then going, oh, yeah, that's that's a mad thing yeah. that we'll work with. Um, so I think that's really helpful. And that's um, down to having people around you who believe in you as well, who say, actually, you can do this. This isn't crazy. Or it is crazy, but crazy in a good way. It's a point about careers too. Like, So anyone listening who's just starting out, this is a midpoint, right? Or Sean's further along than us. I'm probably a bit further. Oh, no, not in terms of theatre. We're about the same probably, Alex, maybe. Uh, I'm definitely at a starting point as a novelist. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, like, I've got my training wheels on as a novelist. But as a <laughs> theatre guy, I'm probably, yeah, sort of mid, I suppose. The trajectory where you are getting published makes it easier. Like doing it into the void is so much harder than getting some contracts, getting people reading stuff, getting feedback on pictures and synopsis and mm. and the whole process gets easier because you're getting some pats and positive reinforcement and even when you have lulls in your career you've got someone like an agent who's cheering you on or Mm. readers who send you lovely emails we also have the skills to enable us to get through these busy patches where we're working on multiple things where uh, can you imagine someone just starting out being given contracts to write a book every three months and i think people sink yes people people can sink early on doing that yeah. I say so, that to students, like, don't wish for it straight away. Like, enjoy your apprenticeship. Yeah. Enjoy building up the skills to be able to be a success. You'll never be more it's free. It's like running a, um, a small business in that way, right? A, a business can't take off too quickly. It actually destroys itself. That often happens in small business with um, supply and demand and then expanding too quickly and it, it sort of falls apart. Yeah. So there's something to be said for pace. I've seen that happen a lot in the romance community and particularly, you know, ebooks really and self indie publishing took off I've been talking about this at work lately Sean will vouch for it in meetings that we need to in academia have a new way of thinking about independent publishing uh, like of, which used to be called self publishing but really isn't anymore because it's such a big part of the industry yes. and people are not doing it because they've been rejected these are often big name New York Times with sellers who have chosen to publish themselves because they make more money out of it yes. mm. and because publishers don't necessarily support them in ways they can support themselves and you often see indie published people now on the New York Times for seller list and it's a whole different way of being but you see in that community people can really get burnt out yes because you you are running this small business and doing the publishing and doing the marketing and doing all the stuff the publisher does as well as what the writer does and so you i have seen a lot of burnout in the last few years and mm. it's a big issue that might be something we talk about um at a later point as well like the different tiers of publishing or not tears even the different arms or like I'm imagining yeah. a giant octopus in my brain yeah. now but sadly we are we are coming to an end this, these things Aww, they seem they to go, go so quicker fast. and quicker yeah I know I think when we first started it was like oh what are we doing we're getting drunk and giggling okay now now we have so much <laughs> that to only share happened once. that happened once and it didn't make it to air no, that's Sean true. said we didn't make enough sense to actually <laughs> be published which is fair enough I think it was an uh, it was our very first outtake there's probably just us <laughs> going <laughs> just, just all that work for an excerpt I like, you know sean didn't sean didn't drink though because he was doing all the technical stuff so it's just me and alex and alex described us as like a broadcaster and a couple of gremlins <laughs> i'll always stand by it but there's nothing wrong with being a gremlin no. um good luck juggling your multiple selves your multiple projects uh and i suppose i'm gonna have to say it because i'm hosting i'm gonna have to say the thing <laughs> oh, oh no. here it comes Happy juggling. Happy okay, that's juggling. that's Betty. That's that's Betty. Oh God, <laughs> who's Betty? <laughs> Alex Bye, Betty. needs another coffee. <laughs> Happy juggling, everybody. Happy juggling. Bye. <laughs> Why don't you write when you don't need money? All your notes sound alike too much. All of them start with "I love you, honey," but they end with the same old touch. Just for change, send a nice loving letter and cut out that please remit. Why don't you write when you don't need money, honey? That would certainly make a hit. He didn't even say it. <laughs> he suggested it, he but he didn't even out. say it. I did totally say it. copped I out there. Of, I said it before. Oh, okay. okay. All right, Betty. Okay. Um, let's, <laughs> Bye, uh, Betty. Let, let's stop recording. <laughs> Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzcastNetwork.com for details.